Good afternoon and namaste, everyone. Welcome to last session. Welcome to the sixth session of the Two and a Half Front War, India's Internal Security Challenges Conference. I am Sneha Kathy Sebastian, a research associate with the forum. In this session, we will discuss India's security challenges in the 21st century. The session chair is Commodore Srikant Deshmukh. Commodore S.L. Deshmukh has received the North Sena Medal and served in the Indian Navy for 32 years. Sir has held many operational and administrative positions, including Principal Director at Naval Headquarters, Commodore Superintendent of Naval Aircraft Yard, Director at the Naval Institute of Aeronautical Technology, and Project Director of a major naval aviation project. He has presented various papers in international seminars, and his articles have been published in various platforms. The speakers for this session are Major General Rajan Kocha, VSM, PhD, Colonel Dr. Ram Atavale, PhD, Dr. Charu Malhotra, PhD, and Dr. Push Bajaj, PhD. I welcome all the speakers and request Commodore Deshmukh, sir, to proceed with the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sneha. Good afternoon. First of all, my thanks to Indic Researchers Forum for giving me this opportunity. It's indeed my honor to be chairing a session where very eminent speakers are available to give their expert comments. And <clears throat> I'm 100% sure that from this session, we will benefit because the topics which have been chosen for this session are unique and very important as far as the India is concerned. In this session, we will be focusing on the topics which are related to civil society, a new frontier for a war. It's very crystal clear that the false propaganda or the psychological war or those kind of things used by the adversary or by the people who want to disturb the internal peace, the impact on that, on the polity of the nation can be very grave and it can create a lot of trouble for us. Therefore, it is important for us to understand the impact of the social media and other means which can be used to influence the civil population in India. And therefore, I consider this topic to be extremely critical for us to deliberate upon and uh, make some tangible recommendations how to tackle with this situation. Therein after, we will be shifting our focus to CBR and threats and the national security. And we are indeed fortunate to have a very, very eminent expert to speak on the CBRN. We have to understand that the concept of CBRN in our nation, especially for the civil people, is not much very clear. We do not know what CBRN means, what are the means and ways are to be used to safeguard against such threats. Being a naval officer, I had an experience of what CBRN means, protecting a ship against a nuclear, chemical, biological war, maintenance of airtight integrity, maintenance of the citadel, maintenance of the CBRN suits, and doing the drills of fighting fire in the CBRN environment are very, very critical features, you know. And we really need to understand the impact of CBRN on the national economy and the national security. So the eminent speaker will be focusing on that. Next, then we shift to the threat of cyber warfare and the artificial intelligence. The cyber warfare is a very real threat. Quite a few of us have already gone through it. Very, very secured platforms which were acclaimed that nobody could hack them have been hacked and it has been proven that if we have got a platform, we will have a hacker who will enter into it. Therefore, having a very potent means to encounter, rather counter the cyber warfare is very important. Coupled with that, artificial intelligence is one of the fields which has made, made the big inroads in India. And right from the businesses, improving the business policies, business processes, into the having the intelligence uh, into the robotics has become a galaxy where we have to focus and see how artificial intelligence could be integrated to fight and to encounter uh, rather counter 
the threats which are emanating from the two and a half front war what we'll be focusing last but not the least we will be talking about the climatic change where we would focus on to the uh, water security and the food security of india it's a very important topic and i must compliment indic researchers forum for picking it up water threat is generally not understood by us frankly speaking when i see people washing roads using the tap water i do not know what to do with it we have to sensitize the normal population what we are going to go through in a uh, very short while as per the statistical research which has been done it has been told that by 2030 india will be running 50% short of the potable water we have to understand the impact of that drinking water problem our agricultural economy going to be hit and industry will suffer if the sector suffer because of water scarcity you can very well imagine the impact what is going to have on to our economy it is therefore very important for us to focus on these subjects and uh, come up with the uh, some viable recommendations for the policy makers uh, these were my opening remarks and i would like to now introduce the speakers in this particular session the first of the speakers who will be dealing with the civil society and the frontier war is my guide mentor and friend major general dr rajan kochar bsm phd thank you sir uh, he is former mgaoc of the central command he has commanded key logistic units of the indian army such as commandant of the central ordnance depot and the divisional ordnance units of the infantry and the rapid divisions he has done active service in operational areas of jammu and kashmir and the northeast he is the recipient of the vishishta seva medal awarded by the president of india he has also been awarded with army commander's commendations twice he holds a doctorate in emotional intelligence and is a certified nlp practitioner coach welcome major general coach coach thank you very much sir welcome sir our next speaker is colonel dr ram athavle i really don't know what to speak about him he is the expert on the cbrn and sir i must say it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you on this particular session dr athavle is a specialist in cbrn security risk mitigation and incident management he holds a phd for his doctoral research in cbrn counter terrorism an 81 batch veteran officer he was last posted as a director cbrn at army headquarters he has been a key cbrn advisor to the government of india and the european union cbrn risk mitigation centers of excellence initiative eu cbrn coe a prolific writer in cbrn journals and the defense and security magazines colonel athavle has authored a pioneering book on the cbrn incident management in india titled toxic portents presently based at pune india he functions as a cbrn security consultant and a visiting adjunct faculty at some indian and overseas universities academic institutions and military training establishments we are indeed fortunate to have such a eminent person who will be speaking to us on the cbr thank you sir next i would like to welcome dr malhotra who is deemed as a global techno evangelist in the domain of digital transformation in governance cyber crime safety and security smart and inclusive cities <laughs> technology and the public policy formulation and digital india with more than 30 years of national and international professional experience her doctoral research on design of citizen centric e governance approach a study of select ict based rural initiatives still stays as a driving force her passion training is another area of interest holding the privilege of being a national resource person for training of trainers certified by the government of india and accredited by the thames valley uk 
she has more than 90 publications in international and national journals and conferences to her credit ma'am very warm welcome and we await your comments and your expertise last but not the least i am honored to welcome dr pushp bajaj who is a research fellow and head of the blue economy and the climate change cluster at national maritime foundation in new delhi he was recently recognized as a fellow of 2021 and 22 coalition for the disaster resilient infrastructure fellowship he has published several articles in international peer reviewed journals and the reputed digital and the print news platforms and magazines on sustainable development climate science climate policy and the related areas he received his phd in chemistry from the university of california san diego usa he is an alumni of indian institute of technology madras in tamil nadu and the st stephen's college of university of delhi india we really look forward to your considered views on climate change and the india's food and water security doctor welcome uh, may i just request all the panelists to restrict their talk to about 25 minutes so that we are left with some time for question and answers once again very warm welcome and we all look forward to the very uh, knowledgeable discussions from the panelists who are so eminent in their subject thank you uh, may i now request major general coacher to take over and deliver his views thank you so much thank you very much deshmukh sir for the wonderful introduction as a matter of fact uh, there is a lot to learn from you too which i have learned also and uh, my journey in the army 37 years closely following the population of the country having had 18 postings in 37 years i can confidently say that i have traveled with the length and breadth of the country felt the pulse of the people mixed around with all caste creed and religion and therefore my interest in this subject and the topic for today civil society recent times we have been hearing a lot about this civil society and how it has been manipulated as a new frontier and i will not call it as the fourth frontier and i will elaborate that in my talk as i go along why i don't call it as a frontier of warfare uh we are aware of a gray zone or hybrid warfare but uh, let us not confuse it with the civil society because civil society is all uh, pervasive it comprises of uh, me and you with different ideological opinions having the diverse opinions does not mean that you are an enemy of the state this point is to be i wanted to make this point very clear because unfortunately there are some sections of our own people who lack the tolerance to accept the others a point of view Uh, we are a nation of diverse cultures and we need to understand this and uh, here i would uh, quote uh, sadguru uh, the nation is not the land uh, it's the people in transforming the people we shall have a great nation uh, so it is the responsibility of each one of us uh, today who are on a social platform who have a followers who have listeners to be very very careful in what we say in public 
this term civil society uh, i feel has been very loosely used uh, to my mind it is basically an amalgamation of a voluntary collective actions around shared interests purposes and values it is basically a network of a group of people and communities that bind the people together for example professional associations non government organizations loosely structured community based organizations so when these organizations collectively come together they become a very potent force to uh, influence public opinion and in a democracy like ours it plays a very monumental role in the shaping the interests of the people who uh, individually do not have the courage to express their opinion in a free and a bold manner you see uh, many of us uh, if we are asked to express our own opinion in a public forum we will hesitate uh, but if we are in a group uh, the herd mentality comes into play Uh, then we get all of a sudden the courage and the motivation to speak out therefore this civil society becomes a powerful tool which can easily be manipulated to serve the vet, uh, vested interests of individuals uh, religious groups or political parties to spread a particular message which would be at a variance to the overall a national interest what is the impact then of this civil society we are talking about your public opinion is paramount and the recent examples i will just give you is the farmers agitation and the shaheen bag uh, episode a single issue Uh, could be uh, uh, transformed by certain vested interests to hold the entire nation to ransom uh, people uh, blocked the roads uh, government was at loggerheads without creating a violence kind of a situation uh, how do we remove these people from here so uh, therefore Uh, when the national security advisor in a recent uh, address to the police uh, academy he started a debate on civil society and he called it as a new frontier of war or the fourth generation of war it is uh, therefore a paramount for each one of us to understand what he was getting at he, he was also mandating the uh, police to take on the responsibility to protect the people who are subverted divided and manipulated but this mechanism in a democracy cannot succeed what we require is a whole nation approach it uh, cannot be uh, left to the policing uh, to start enforcing a particular line of action when the people uh, thinking and ideology is not going to accept it because uh, no amount of uh, coercion can uh, make the people on the streets listen to you so when we uh, call it a fourth generation warfare i want our viewers to understand what is a fourth generation warfare it is uh, basically a conflict where the state loses its monopoly on war and is fighting non state actors 
uh, that is a terror groups and insurgents it is believed to be the fourth stage of evolution in uh, warfare but the first generation warfare is the formal uh, battlefield war uh, second generation is related to the use of artillery uh, technological weapons and third generation warfare is the speed surprise and infiltration into the enemy's military uh, therefore i would uh, 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 talk in the terms of a military strategy that a fourth generation warfare is related to the world of cultures a use of islam to approach the minds of a certain set of a population uh, therefore this civil society i don't uh, think uh, can be in no imagination a uh, called a four generation warfare uh, then uh, uh, how do we uh, make sure our civil society is not Uh, uh, subverted it is uh, not anti national it uh, does not speak against the state and uh, here i uh, feel uh, comes the role of the social media social media's uh, role i uh, personally uh, visualize is the role of influencers they play an extremely pivotal role in the shaping up the civil society in uh, several instances and i can narrate to you many of them it has been observed that uh, there is a definitive link between online barbs and offline violence and spread of hate we have seen the potential use and abuse of platforms like the facebook twitter instagram to spread hate messages and you the proliferation is very easy it just takes less than 10 seconds to send a message and make it viral and that is why whenever Uh, there is a problem envisaged a uh, right like situation is envisaged but the fourth the first and the foremost action the government uh, does is to uh, jam all networks because these uh, networks are used extent extensively by uh, such people to uh, subvert the minds of the civil uh, society to understand this civil society in a slightly uh, better uh, uh, manner and and how they are getting purged today in the course of our discussion in the last one and a half days today we have heard various speakers speak on radicalization of the youth we have uh, talked about the deobandi sect we have uh, talked about rohingyas Uh, they are all part of the civil society and uh, they are being uh, radicalized so i'll just uh, uh, narrate a report which i accessed uh, from the internet a uh, uh, a report which has been prepared by the intelligence bureau a few years back and it uh, brought forth some very interesting facts it said that while uh, caste discrimination human rights uh, water resource issues were earlier uh, chosen by international organizations to discredit uh, india in the global uh, forums uh, there has been a recent uh, shift in the choice of issues with a view to encourage a uh, growth retarding campaigns religious freedom and protection of livelihood the report observes 
that NGOs have become central players in crafting agenda, coverage in the print media, using scholar turned activists, former diplomats and defense officials to spread a specific propaganda. The report also adds that these activities are funded by foreign donors and serve as tools for the strategic foreign policy and psychological and information warfare interest of specific nations and a recent example is China and Pakistan. What was happening in Jammu and Kashmir? You, why was stone pelting going on? Who, who were the people who were funding this stone pelters? And why now there is no stone pelting? So the answers are absolutely, absolutely, you know, I'm clear to you that who is funding certain sections of the society and trying to discredit the entire term of the civil society. And for the government, it's a very, very challenging task. It's a, it's a task as an army man, if I am told to defend my country against external enemies, you, my enemy is identified. I know whom to hit. But here, there is no uh, you, identification of the enemy. The people within the civil society are plotting and planning against our own national interests. So how do we identify them? It becomes all the more difficult for the government. And here I would uh, take a stand. Many may not like it, but we need responsible political leadership in the country, which keeps the national honor and pride the foremost and not speak and incite people to gain votes. Whenever we have these elections coming by, we find these kind of speeches on communal lines taking place in our country, it needs to end. And I would, I have also mentioned in my article on civil society, which was published in the Economic Times last week, I would recommend a short formal training for all the newly elected member of parliaments and the MLAs. It is important for them to understand what the nation is, what the nation means. And it's a sense of responsibility must come into play if we have to prevent a subversion of the civil society. The second aspect I would like to draw your attention is the role of media in propagating certain ideologies related to a religion, caste or creed. But the present IT and sedition laws need a review with an aim to check the perpetual violators. It needs to be understood here that rationality and proportionality are the two most important elements for media self-regulation. We could uh, take a leaf from the nations such as Australia and Germany who have imposed the fines and imprisonment on anyone uh, violating norms for inciting the passions using uh, hate speeches. You, uh, the uh, United Kingdom has recently uh, published a paper online harms 
that establishes norms for conducting of media programs and events the third most important aspect is the curriculum we actually set in our educational institutions in promoting the cultural heritage of our country as well as the inculcation of the moral and the ethical values if we nurture our children well only then we can expect them to grow as responsible citizens of the country the country today needs to invest in its youth because this is where the future lies Sixty-five uh, percent of our uh, population today is uh, less than thirty-five years of age. We are a very uh, young country, and uh, therefore we uh, need to invest in the youth of our country. And it would not be out of place if I can uh, suggest uh, the National Cadet uh, Corps as an important uh, platform. for the youth to join uh, to nurture uh, discipline and nation building it's important uh, i have been a commander ncc in indore and i had 18000 ncc uh, cadets with me and 20 days in a month i used to be touring and i used to be uh, visiting all educational institutions schools colleges uh, trying to exhort the youth of our country uh, to join the ncc uh, i specifically uh, went to the convent and the public schools because government schools uh, contribute a lot uh, to the ncc but these schools do not and uh, their uh, uh, children while speaking to them i was surprised had absolutely no idea what the ncc does and what the ncc means in uh, one of the convent schools uh, uh, when i uh, started my uh, lecture uh, i asked them uh, I, uh, how many of you would like to join the ncc and uh, around 200 students were there in that uh, meeting and only two hands were raised and after speaking to speaking to them for about an hour i asked them the same question uh, uh, there were more than 100 hands which had been raised so that is what i am telling you that we have to reach out to the youth of our country make them understand what the nation actually means to each one of us uh, the answer uh, therefore i'd like to conclude uh, lies in the whole of nation approach where the political uh, leadership uh, the media uh, the educational institutions and the necessary uh, legal and regulatory mechanisms would uh, need to play an important uh, role in molding the behavior and opinion of the civil society uh, towards a progressive mindset uh, leading to a more harmonious environment of uh, nation building and uh, dear uh, friends unless this happens we are uh, waiting for a ticking uh, time bomb to explode and uh, no amount of uh, fire fighting could then uh, remedy the situation i have listened to all the speakers in the last two days and they have all spoken about internal you know, internal security challenges the internal security challenges can only be met if all of us the citizens of this country are united who speak one language and who are able to identify their friends and their enemies and only if we are able to do that we can talk about our nation becoming a superpower i mean a mere slogans shouting and bravado will not lead us anywhere that is my message 
uh, to all of you stand you uh, united stand uh, together and uh, build the nation thank you very much jai hind thank you general sir for a very well articulated talk you did focus on the very eminent role of the civil society in the national building and the national security linkage with it you dwelt on the cause and effect relationship very well especially focusing on the roles of the ngos and the media which is currently playing and ending with the very specific recommendations which are within the realm of feasibility and which need to be implemented for uh, betterment of our nation thank you so very much sir thank you very much uh, it's my honor now to invite colonel dr athavle an expert on the cbrn to deliver his talk enlightening us the aspects of the cbrn how it relates to national security and the various measures india needs to take for that over to you doctor thank you uh so you are muted sorry yeah, yeah. uh thank you so much uh, deshmukh sir uh i would like to thank indic uh researchers forum especially uh, yashas arya and uh, my good friend uh, general gocha who actually roped me in to come and uh, speak on this subject today uh, it has been an enlightening two days frankly speaking to listen to various uh, eminent speakers on internal threats faced by india having been uh, in the armed forces for more than 30 years i have also traveled across the country and uh, understood what is ailing india but there are some aspects which uh, tend to get neglected and uh, if i may dare say uh, indian population is uh, a population which forgets easily and is a very complacent kind of an uh, 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 citizenry and we need to uh, in the changing world we need to slightly change our ethos we need to start being vigilant around us what is happening and take notice of that in a corrective manner and and towards that uh, i would like to uh, talk today on a subject which is less understood less talked about uh, but has been causing hundreds and thousands of casualties across the world and more in india Uh, in the past few years uh, it is something which is not new but it has been uh, sort of uh, shunted aside and not talked of so i would like to highlight this particular subject and make uh, uh, my views very clear on what uh, cbrn threats are uh, and uh, how uh, india needs to tackle uh, cbrn threats of course like uh, deshmukh sir mentioned uh, i have published a book on the subject and i would like uh, more and more people to read that book uh, it is not a technical book in any way it is meant for citizen to read and understand what are the uh, aspects uh, about cbrn threats and how our country needs to work towards uh, mitigating those so if i may be permitted i would like to share my uh, presentation and my screen now so that we can go ahead with this subject uh indic i need to be given uh, uh so do you to share permission so you can use it using that button over there uh, you can share your screen or if you want we can present your uh... let me let me try again Uh, is my screen visible now? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, visible now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. So I shall be talking about CBR and threats and the challenges that we face uh, to national security. Uh, before we go on to what 
are these threats? Let us first understand what is CBRN. Uh, for those of you who have not had any uh, uh, contact with this subject, uh, CBRN stands for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. It's a very vast field. Earlier, uh, it used to be called as NBC, or after the Gulf War, what the Americans coined the weapons of mass destruction, where all that constitutes CBRN or chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. Uh, just to highlight uh, the hazard, uh, this is these are the internationally recognized symbols that you see on the left. Uh, for the chemical, you see the one which is in yellow. Uh, then biological on the right, which of course you must have seen quite a lot during COVID-19 all over the place, you will find the biological symbol uh, being uh, displayed. Uh, then we have the radiological, which is also very commonly seen in X-ray departments and so on, especially uh, CT scan, PET scan, X-ray departments, you'll find the radiological symbol. And the nuclear symbol, which of course is part of the uh, Atomic Energy Commission's uh, logo also. Uh, so these are the four symbols. My only uh, request to all of you is that please ensure that these symbols are used in the right manner because they convey a type of hazard, a danger which is there. Don't go around doing what I saw in Kenya when I was deployed there with the EU uh, program. I saw this bus passing me on the road and the whole bus has been decorated with the biological hazard symbol as if it's something to, you know, uh, fill the bus uh, around with uh, some nice decorative kind of, uh, you know, curvaceous kind of stuff and therefore you decorate the whole bus like that. That is not the way to display this. It's a, it's a very serious kind of a symbol uh, depicting a type of hazard and we should not indulge in what you see on the slide uh, in the on the bus uh, picture. So uh, with that as a little background, let us see what are CBRN agents and weapons. I was told that uh, I must bring out a little bit about this before we go on to how we are dealing with these and what are the kind of threats that we are facing. So uh, a quick re recap on what are the CBRN agents and uh, weapon systems. Uh, nuclear weapons are primarily uh, weapons which have been developed on the concept of either splitting an atom or you know uh, fusing a couple of atoms, uh, uh, so which result. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, sir, but uh, your presentation is not moving. Uh, the sh uh, it is only showing CBRN threats and challenges to national security of first light. Oh. So if you may oh. permit, uh, we can probably share your screen. Uh, wait, let me uh, try again. Yeah, uh, sure. If it still doesn't work, then uh, just a moment. Is it within me? No, I think uh, uh, there is some problem from this side. I'm not able to share my screen. Yes, yes. can you just please help? Yes, sir. So we'll, uh, share, we'll share the presentation. Yeah, I'll, I'll be grateful. So nice of you. I hope so you're going to tell us which slide presentation. we should go to. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll keep telling you that. So, do we have the presentation up? Yeah, Mona, please start. Uh, it's on. All... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, I was on what is CBRN? Uh, it uh, stands for Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear. And uh, like it was earlier called NBC or uh, WMD, weapons of mass destruction after the Gulf War. Uh, we have uh, these, can you just click? We have these four symbols. I explained to them, uh, explained to you about these four symbols, especially the bio, which you see now in COVID and the radiological, which is a common one in X-ray departments or uh, you know, PET scan and CT scan areas. 
uh, the nuclear, nuclear is uh, quite, uh, quite familiar, familiar uh, uh, which is there which with is the there atomic with energy, energy uh, uh, agency. agency. And, uh, and this, uh, is this is the chemical symbol, symbol which, which all of these represent, 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 represent chemical, chemical hazards. hazards. Now, now uh, can, uh, can you click again, again and show the, and picture? Show the picture? Yeah. yeah. Now, on this now, slide, on this, on this picture, on this you picture, see a bus being decorated, decorated with this symbol. This symbol. Now, the now, symbol is actually a hazard symbol. So, this is a very wrong way of using the symbol uh, in decorating something. So, please be careful. If you if you see these four symbols, they mean uh, a type of danger, and that is why these symbols have been generated. Yeah. Next, please. Yeah. Next. Okay, coming first to the nuclear weapons. Uh, nuclear weapons are based on a technology of either fusing uh, two atoms or uh, splitting an atom, thereby uh, effecting a lot of release of energy. Uh, as you see on the slide, the energy is uh, manifested in an intense flash of light, uh, a shock or a blast wave, which is there, which is what actually does a whole lot of physical damage. Uh, and then we have the thermal radiation, which creates fires, large fires across the countryside. And last is the radiation part, whether it is the ionizing radiation, which is an immediate one, or it is the residual radiation, like the gamma radiation, which remains in the atmosphere for a very long time. It could be in the rivers and trees, on, on the debris lying around, and, and so on. So these are the effects of a nuclear explosion. And that particular area, will actually need to be abandoned or buried uh, to be able to use them, uh, use it again. Uh, like you see in Chernobyl, what has happened, the area has remained abandoned for uh, many number of years, for decades actually. The same thing is going to happen in Fukushima in certain surrounding areas where the radioactivity still persists, you'll have to leave that area. Uh, the two main uh, nuclear weapon detonations which have happened in, in anger, uh, are the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which you see on the right, on 6th and 9th of August, uh, 1945, which actually led to the end of uh, Second World War, uh, especially for the Japanese. Uh, below, you will see the uh, pictures which show the effects of radiation on a person. It looks like a burn, and, and therefore it is called radiation burns. I've also put some pictures of uh, the... Uh, systems that you use to deploy these weapons, whether it is by ships or aircraft or missiles, uh, even artillery guns can be used and so on. Uh, can we have the next slide? Then we have something called the improvised nuclear device, uh, the, also known as INDs for short. Basically, these are illicit nuclear weapons, stolen or uh, otherwise originating from a nuclear state. Uh, they could also be built from components of a stolen, stolen weapon in, in a very crude kind of a manner. Uh, normally, such weapons would uh, try to use the gun type design, which is a simpler design or the simplest design in a nuclear weapon. Uh, a lot of uh, talk is going on about the use of INDs or, you know, uh, the procuring of INDs by terrorist organizations. And that's why I thought I would uh, present this particular slide to you. Can we have the next one? Uh, coming to radiological weapons, now there's a subtle difference between a nuclear weapon and a radiological weapon. In a nuclear weapon, a huge amount of technology, complex technology is required to be able to split or fuse atoms. And it's a very costly kind of a technology. But there are materials available in nature which are radioactive in, you know, naturally radioactive substances. Like you have cesium, uh, cobalt, iridium, polonium and so on. Now, these kind of substances can be used to spread radioactivity. We are using these kind of substances in medical devices, in industrial gauging and uh, clocking devices and so on. Uh, even in the uh, uh, field of uh, petrochemicals, we are using uh, devices for depth gauges and all that. Now, if we were to use the same uh, radioactive substance in a powdered form, uh, mixed uh, or packed inside a conventional explosive and you detonate that explosive, you will have a huge amount of debris around uh, the because of the explosive nature of that explosive. But this dust, this radioactive dust will also get sort of sprayed all over the countryside. Each speck of this dust is radioactive in nature and it would spread radioactivity around. 
depending on what type of uh, agent you are using or what type of uh, isotope you are using, uh, depending on the half-life of that, you may have to abandon that area for a very long time. Imagine this kind of a device going off in a crowded marketplace. Depending on the uh, explosive uh, content, uh, maybe about 50 meters or 100 meters radius of that area would be totally damaged and fully radioactive. It would be uh, impossible to clean up that radioactivity in that area. So that is the kind of uh, power this radiological weapons can have. Uh, no uh, rocket science technology being used, very simple methods, but highly potent kind of a weapon system. And therefore they are called dirty bombs. Now these dirty bombs are being researched by a whole lot of terror organizations. Uh, I will show you a, a slide as to where uh, such terror uh, means have been used. In fact, there was a guy called uh, Dhiren Bharot, uh, a member of Al-Qaeda who was caught in London uh, with a ready dirty bomb. Uh, thankfully, he was caught before he managed to use it. He was planning to use it on the London metro system. And he was caught just before that by Scotland Yard. It, it's, it's, it's just uh, lucky. So such kind of things are being uh, devised. Uh, next one. Coming to biological agents. Biological agents are all around us. If you use a biological agent in a, in a malified or an offensive manner, it becomes a biological weapon. Common cold is also a biological agent. We don't use it in an offensive manner. But if you go and sneeze in somebody's face, obviously you're trying to use it in a, in a, as a weapon system. Uh, the common types of biological agents which are there are bacteria, rickshia, virus, fungi, and toxins. Now, uh, can you click? Toxins are something which are very peculiar. They are, these are plant and animal-based poisons. Now, the difference between the rest of the uh, type of biological agents and toxins is these are non-contagious. They will not spread from a person to person. So it is easier to target a selected target audience with toxins without the uh, danger of having spreading that disease uh, everywhere else. As compared to uh, the viruses or bacteria, you've seen what uh, virus is doing nowadays. It's spreading from person to person without any control. It doesn't happen in the case of toxins. So toxins are considered to be uh, favored uh, biological agents by uh, the uh, terrorist organizations. Uh, so click please. Uh, these are some examples of how biological agents have been used in the past. Uh, I would like to focus on the Japanese biological weapons program in World War II. It was an extensive program uh, working with plague, anthrax, cholera, and typhoid. A uh, lot of uh, Chinese uh, prisoners of war, uh, areas which have been captured by Japan in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Australian prisoners of war, and so on. Uh, were all subjected to very gory kind of uh, measures, uh, experiments also by the Japanese uh, military and the scientists. Those of you who are interested more, you can uh, read up on this. I think it is called 721 or 791, uh, Unit 721 or 791, I think. Uh, it's there on the internet, so you can read up on that. It's a very gory kind of a thing. You need to have a very strong stomach to be able to read uh, about those kind of things. Uh, Germany also uh, tried to use a whole lot of biological weapons uh, during World War I, uh, including glanders, which affects horses. You can see a picture I posted there with a horse uh, being uh, put with a mask on its muzzle to prevent it from getting infected by glanders. So uh, uh, there have been umpteen cases where uh, biological agents have been used in warfare before uh, as biological warfare. Next, please. What is of concern now is genetic engineering and biological warfare. If you are able to mutate a particular a biological agent where it increases pathogenicity, you change its antigenetic structure. You make it so that it, it becomes resistant to the drugs that you are already using and therefore increase the potency of that biological agent. There are even uh, programs like the CRISPR, uh, where you can do gene editing and you can make uh, a person resistant to certain types of viruses or uh, bacteria and things like that. You can even make him uh, more prone to such kind of uh, diseases by, by reverse uh, use of the CRISPR technology. 
So these are the kind of things which are coming up now. There are laboratories which are researching on these kind of things. And I will like to highlight about laboratory safety when I come to that a little later. Please keep that in mind when, when we talk about this, uh, when we come to the terrorism aspect of that. Yeah, next please. Coming to chemical weapons, these are known as the common man's atom bomb. Toxic chemicals are available everywhere in our surroundings, right from our homes where we are dealing with things like mortine and heart pick and feviquick and things like that. I mean, if you put a drop of feviquick on your finger and you see what effect it has on your finger, your skin burns actually. Same is the case with heart pick and mortine and things like that, which are highly uh, potent pesticides. They're meant to kill. Of course, humans don't consume them and therefore we don't die of it. But if you do and don't do it, uh, you would die of that. So that is the kind of potency which is there in chemicals all around us, including drugs which are there. So if you use such chemicals in a potent manner, uh, in, a, in an offensive manner, of course, it becomes chemical weapon. Uh, military grade or warfare grade chemical weapons are classified as uh, blister agents, choking agents, blood agents, nerve agents, and incapacitating agent. As the name suggests, that is the kind of effect it has on the body. Uh, I've put some pictures on the right to show you what blister agents do or what nerve agents do. The one on the top who's frothing in his mouth is a, is a victim of a nerve agent. So what you see the other pictures are blister agents where uh, sulfur mustard and uh, things like that, uh, they cause uh, large blisters on your body. And such agents have been used uh, by terrorists and by uh, armies across the world. Can we have the next slide? Coupled with that are toxic industrial chemicals. These are commonly used chemicals in hundreds and thousands of tons. They are being used on a daily basis in, in industry, in different kinds of industry, whether it, is, whether it is paint or dye stuff or textile or automotive, whatever industry you say, including pharmaceutical industry, they are using a huge amount of these toxic chemicals. I've highlighted some of them in red. Uh, because these are the ones which have actually had a lot of accidents. Ammonia, chlorine, formaldehyde, very commonly available in, in the market as well as in uh, use. But they are termed as high hazard chemicals. We, we have heard of Bhopal uh, where methyl isocyanate was used. And mind you, methyl isocyanate has been termed as a medium hazard. So you can imagine what chlorine, ammonia or formaldehyde would be doing. Even in medical colleges, they have huge tanks of formaldehyde to keep carcasses uh, fresh for the next day's use for training. That is the type of chemicals that we are using. Uh, last to last year, there was an accident in Vizac uh, in I think May 2020, where styrene uh, gas leaked out and a whole lot of casualties happened, uh, similar to what happened in Bhopal. Uh, again, styrene is in the medium hazard this thing. So, such kind of toxic chemicals are everywhere around us and we need to use them very carefully. And that is why uh, it is not industrial safety which is of importance. Yes, it is very important. But I would also relate it to industrial security. How much are you securing these chemicals on site and not allowing pilferage and sabotage and things like that to happen? Next slide, please. Uh, again, a huge amount of use of chemicals uh, uh, as warfare agents in history, uh, especially World War I, where tons and tons of chemicals were used uh, by the Germans, uh, especially the mustard gas and uh, chlorine, which was used by the Germans in, in, uh, in a lot of uh, areas in Europe, uh, used by Japanese again during Second World War, along with the biological agents, a huge amount of uh, chemicals were used by the Japanese uh, against uh, the public. Uh, mustard gas and serine has been uh, a favorite with uh, the Iraqis when they, especially Saddam Hussein, used it against the Kurdish people in northwest Iraq. Uh, recently, and it's ongoing actually, uh, chlorine and serine, which is a nerve agent, uh, has been used uh, by the Syrians uh, in their conflict. And uh, the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapon, which is the uh, ombudsman for uh, this, has uh, actually proven the use of such kind of chemicals in the Syrian conflict. It is an ongoing kind of a problem. Uh, we, they are facing their, uh, these kind of threats on a daily basis. Next, please. So we have seen what CBRN weapon systems and agents are. Let us see what is the threat now. Yeah, thank you. Next slide. Okay. 
I have divided the threats in natural and uh, man-made. Uh, natural threats are disease outbreaks, like we have the uh, COVID going on now, or environmental toxicity, like you had arsenic coming up in the groundwater in Punjab and so on. But it is the man-made ones which we can control, but which are the more threatening ones. We have industrial accidents. Uh, I mean, they are having uh, industrial accidents uh, on a on a alarming frequency taking place in our country, not only in our country, but uh, in many places in the world. We have logistic accidents, tankers meeting with accidents uh, uh, which are uh, spewing toxic chemicals around. We have laboratory accidents. Uh, some say the COVID-19 is a laboratory accident which has happened in Wuhan, uh, possibly. Uh, we have environmental pollution which is taking place. Those of my friends who are in Delhi uh, and uh, the NCR area would be uh, aware of the smog which happens every year and the kind of problems that it is creating. And last, of course, is the waste and effluents. Mind you, my city, Pune, it's itself generating about 1,800 tons of waste every day on a daily basis. How much of it is toxic and how is it being managed? I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling kind of an exercise. So these are the kind of threats which are all over around us. And then you have the deliberate kind of a threat. Uh, somebody throwing acid on somebody's face, maybe a jilted lover or something, but that is a deliberate act of causing casualties. And I think it should come under a criminal poisoning and not just a law and order kind of a situation. State parties using CBRN threats. Yes, we, I, I mentioned to you about Syria, about Japan, about uh, Germany, there are uh, CBRN uh, laboratories which are existing in many countries and there are CBRN programs which are existing. Uh, chemical weapons, biological weapons, you know, nuclear weapons have been developed uh, in many countries today. And last of course is CBRN terrorism and this is something which I would like to highlight on a little more because this is actually a fact and it is happening. Next please. One more. Okay, so how do we stop these two? To stop these two, we need to pay attention to the blow on the left, the industrial, the logistic, and the laboratory. Because that is the source of the material which they will be using for CBRN terrorism or maybe a state-sponsored uh, CBRN terrorism. Where will they get the material from? They will get it from the market. They will get it from the industry. They will get it from laboratories or sabotage uh, transportation or uh, a uh, warehouse kind of a, a storage of such uh, chemicals. And therefore, to stop or to prevent CBRN terrorism taking place, we need to address security on the aspects which have been mentioned on the left. Next, please. Uh, these are some uh, recent CBRN incidents that have taken place. I've mentioned about the uh, uh, radiological uh, CBRN incident in Delhi, which happened in 2010 in Mayapuri, where there was a radiation leak from a, 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 a laboratory kind of a device, which Delhi University had uh, put out auction. Uh, we have seen the Beirut uh, blast uh, last to last year, where we had uh, 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate going up in flames and smoke. The amount of damage that it had created, almost half of Beirut got damaged. Uh, we have also seen the uh, styrene gas leak in May 2020. I just talked about it. Uh, there have been many other incidents which are which are happening. Uh, there was an incident this year in uh, uh, Gujarat. There was a, a firecracker uh, fire in uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, I think in December or November last year. Uh, then again last year there was a, a problem in the uh, uh, Baruch. Uh, 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 I think uh, phosphorus uh, uh, company. Uh, so there have been many such incidents which keep happening on an on on uncanny regularity. And uh, most of it is uh, lack of uh, safety and say, uh, security in these industries. Next. These are the industrial accidents from 2014 to 17. I got this graph from the Hindu uh, data point uh, database. You can see the number of uh, toxic industrial accidents uh, and how many deaths have happened there. Even firecracker matches factory uh, or fire in uh, industries are toxic in nature because there is chemical burning. There is some in inflammable stuff which is burning, plastics burning, thermocoal burning. Uh, so all these kinds of uh, fire hazards also are resulting in toxic 
uh, casualties. Next, please. Uh, coming to toxic terror, I was talking that it's, it's something real and it is happening around us. And I would like to highlight on the first one on the left, which is there. Uh, this happened when I was there in Kenya. Uh, there were intern doctors, trained intern doctors who were sitting and trying to stabilize anthrax spores to transport them to Europe and use them against the European public as an act of terror. And after they were captured, uh, they, they uh, turned out to be, all these intern doctors turned out to be members of Al-Shabaab terror organization based in Somalia, which is affiliated to the ISIS now. Imagine how many laboratories are there in your country, pathological labs in India. Practically every corner has sprouted pathological labs, especially after COVID has started. What is the control? What kind of testing are they doing there? What are the materials they are using? Are they doing the authorized testing or have they got some other testing going on in that laboratory? Who is monitoring that? Are we having that kind of wherewithal to test and check and you know uh, have an oversight on all these kinds of laboratories? Mind you, terror organizations are growing in skills, in equipment, in technology, in funding, and organizational skills. All of these are growing in terror organizations and they are becoming smart. They are no longer the illiterate cannon fodder which is there. They've got scientists, they've got doctors, they got lab technicians on their payrolls and they are capable of waging that kind of a war. And that is why I thought I would show this slide to you as to what all is happening. We have seen the assassination of King John Man in um, Malaysia with VX, which is a very important nerve agent. Use of Novichok agent in London, in Salisbury, not once, but twice. Navalny the Russian uh, opposition leader who was again poisoned by Novichok agent last year. So there have been many such incidents. I mean, I'm not going back to 1995 when uh, the Om Shinriko had used Sarin to target the Tokyo Metro uh, trains. Many casualties happened in that, but that ha was the start actually. But it's happening today in a number of places and we need to be careful. In fact, ISIS itself uh, is using uh, chlorine and serine in a number of uh, attacks in Syria and uh, in the Kurdish regions. So we need to be very, very careful. We need to be vigilant around us. Next, please. So with those kind of threats already around us, these are the vulnerabilities that we have added on, which actually compound uh, CBRN threats around us. Densely populated cities, low response footprints. I mean, we don't have people to really go and respond to many of these incidents in, in, a, in the classic manner that you would like to do. Awareness, grossly inadequate. We have the best of the legislations, but we are not implementing them correctly. Our implementation is where we are falling short of. Of course, medical services have got a boost after COVID is, uh, has started, but we need to still further improve on that. Next, please. So what are we doing about it? Yeah, next. International initiatives. There have been many international initiatives started with the UN, with the Interpol, with the EU CBRN action plan. That is where I was working for three years with them. Uh, the WHO has a CBRN response plan. Uh, the World Customs Organization. Now, this is an interesting area, which they have got a strategic trade control and a container control program. What is being shipped from here to there? What kind of trade is taking place? What are the materials being traded in? Are they legitimate? What is the end user requirement for that? All this is being controlled by the World Customs Organization. India is a big party to this whole program and we are taking our uh, you know, uh, initiatives in this side. Then there are many other protocols on uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, environmental pollution, the kind of waste that we are generating and so on and so forth. But I would like to list in the next three slides, especially on nuclear, chemical, and biological. Yeah, next one. These are the nuclear treaties and conventions. I will not go into the details of these, but the ones which have been marked in green, India is a signatory to these uh, particular uh, protocols. Uh, the last one in the, in the first uh, bullet, uh, this thing is the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This calls for a total prohibition of nuclear weapons. It has been enacted just last year, January, exactly one year before. 22nd Jan 2021. 
It's a new treaty. Not very many people who have signed this. Only those who have signed who don't have nuclear weapons, obviously, because the people who have nuclear weapons would not like to ban them as yet. Uh, so there is a lot of work which is going on as far as nuclear treaties are concerned. Next one. Coming to the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, India signed this in 1972, the moment it was stable. And we are obligated to maintain our uh, stance of not having developed or produced biological weapons. We have a, a lab which is researching on that to produce antidotes and drugs to counter such kind of threats but we are not having any biological weapons program as such. Next one. Uh, similar thing for the Chemical Weapons Convention. We signed it in 1997, the moment it came up for signatures and ratification. Uh, we had some chemical weapons at that time in 1993, and we were obligated to destroy all of them, which we did uh, as per the uh, uh, deadline given to us. So. Uh, we are following a good protocol as far as CWC is concerned. We have got our own laws and uh, a system in place to ensure that we uh, follow our obligations towards the CWC. We have the DRDO lab in Gwalior, which is uh, looking after uh, the chemical weapons convention and the type of chemical weapons which can be generated and produce antidotes uh, for our troops against such kind of chemical weapons. Next one. Uh, coming to some Indian initiatives which we have taken, uh, I'm, I know I'm going short of time, so we'll run a little faster. Uh, yeah, next one. The thought uh, till the 90s was uh, that uh, this is a Western kind of a feature and you know it's got nothing to do with India, except for the military. Uh, then the thought changed to a disaster kind of a situation that yes, these are disasters which need to be handled. And even till today, actually, it is the NDMA and the NDRF battalions, which are mandated to be the uh, custodians of anything CBRN and the first responders for CBRN. Lately, in the last couple of years, I would say that the thought has started coming out towards CBRN security and looking at it from a national security kind of a perspective. And I'm very happy that that change has happened and we need to further uh, improve upon that kind of a thought process. Next. Uh, so any country's CBRN security paradigm would actually uh, revolve around these aspects. Yeah. The first is to develop a national CBRN security strategy. It will cover the threat, the kind of objective that you would like to have and mandate a governance structure. Next. Then develop a national CBRN plan, which would give out the activities. It would spell out nodal agencies. Next, please. And of course, a timeline and budget. We have these three nodal agencies, nodal ministries, which have been identified by the government for biological, chemical, and radiological and nuclear. Uh, next. Then we have domestic laws and regulations. I will, I will show a slide on that uh, separately. So we'll go ahead. Next. Incident management structure. The first is threat prevention, which we have a whole lot of intelligence agencies, oversight agencies, which are dealing with these kind of things. The second one is crisis prevention. Next. And we have the NDRF battalions, which are the nominated CBRN first responders for crisis and consequence management. The NDMA has issued a huge amount of guidelines on their website, uh, which can be accessed, out of which there are some of the guidelines which are specifically re related to CBRN related incidents. Do read up on them, those who are interested. Next one. These are the CBRN stakeholders. What you see on the blobs in blue on the left are the key stakeholders. But notwithstanding that, all the ones which I have listed on the right hand side are actually CBRN stakeholders. And I would I'd like to add into all this what my previous speaker, General uh, Kocher, had said. Every citizen is a stakeholder in this. And unless we look at it that way, our responsibility towards all this is not going to go away in the right manner. Next one. I mentioned about laws. On the left, you see the number of laws. I would, I think there are more than about a hundred laws in our country which relate to various aspects of CBRN. But you see on the right, there are pending drafts which are there. And I mentioned the year since which they are pending. The first one, chemical management and safety rules, pending since 1998. It's sad that we have not been able to develop a, a, 
uh, comprehensive chemical management and safety rules right since 1998. I, I recently checked up uh, about two months ago. They are still in a draft form. Same is the case with the National Action Plan for Chemicals. And why I'm showing you this is the chemicals, which are the widest in our society, are the most uh, prone because of the laws which are pending. We are not yet governing them in the correct manner. And that is our weak point at the moment. Next one, please. These are the key laboratories, and I'm only showing you the important ones which are there. And the ones which are highlighted in red, especially in the bio ones, uh, the NASAR and the NIV are the biosafety level four laboratories, which are high containment laboratories, which can research on uh, very lethal uh, kind of pathogens, uh, including uh, COVID-19, Ebola, uh, smallpox, and things like that. Uh, we have uh, uh, sorry sir uh, but may i request you to otherwise we'll run short of the time for yeah, questions yeah, just just two, two more slides yeah thank you sir uh, can we go ahead please uh, these are the cbr and specific initiatives which have been taken i mentioned about the ndr battalions we have got radiation emergency response centers we have got the national intelligence grid which has been set up and monitors are being set up at key ports and airports to detect any radioactive substance which is being moved around in, in between there. Uh, so uh, apart from the laws, these are the kind of initiatives which have been taken. Next, please. Uh, we'll skip the equipment part. Just go ahead. Next. Next. Yeah. Next one. Yeah, the, the, I would like to conclude with showing you what are the next steps now. Yeah. Please keep clicking. The, the first is awareness enhancement not just the stakeholders which I showed you, but also amongst the public, amongst the students, amongst the industry people. Everybody needs to be made aware of what are the kind of threats. Develop national CBRN strategy and plan. This is the job of the government in collusion with the industry, with the stakeholders, with laboratories, with academic institutions. Proliferation prevention, that is where CBRN intelligence comes in. And I had written an article on specifically this particular subject, CBRN intelligence. Streamline CBR and prevention in enforcement and oversight and develop good comprehensive response capability. Our NDR battalions are just 12 in the number today and only have one team each which is dealing with CBRN. So only 12 teams in the whole of our country. It's a very, very low footprint, frankly speaking. Next. Develop CBR and equipment capability. We have been talking about Make in India and the kind of capability generation that we have got. It is very sad that last year when I went for Defexpo last time, which is 2020, there were just three Indian companies which were displaying CBR and equipment there. We have a huge base in our country for CBR and equipment. It is sad. We need to nurture that, including drug and antidote stockpiles. Next one. Media engagement. CBRN is a very, very sensitive kind of a, uh, issue. And media engagement needs to be very responsible about that. Uh, especially social media handling. We can't be spreading rumors. You saw what has happened in COVID-19. In a way, I'm actually thankful to COVID-19 for having brought up so many lessons regarding CBRN awareness in, in the uh, uh, environment. Next one. And that is what we need to do now. First is CBRN security culture. And I would like to thank uh, General Kocher again for having brought out a citizen's responsibility in this. And that is what CBRN security culture is. Therefore, we need to have courses for high schools and colleges. Uh, we, uh, I must share with you that last year, we ran the first ever postgraduate diploma in CBRN protection at the University of Pune. Uh, I think that's a very good start which has been made. Uh, even our medical college are not training doctors on handling CBRN casualties, which we need to institute. And in the last is what my dream is, please click to institute and invest in a national CBRN center of excellence. We need that to standardize CBRN training, guidelines, policy. Next, please. That is my book for those of you who are interested. I have finished here. Jai Hind, uh, can you just click on the last slide? That is my uh, website, my contact details. Those of you who are interested, do have a look, do get back to me. I'm open to uh, questions now. Thank you so much for a patient listening. Sorry for having uh, overshot my time frame. Thank you, uh, Colonel Dr. Athole. 
having been associate with the subject and understanding the nuances of the CBRN, I deeply appreciate your efforts in spreading the awareness of the CBRN in general, wherein you have brought in the aspects of the what are the contents of the CBRN, what are the threats which could be posed by them, finally ending with where India genuinely lacks, uh, which is a matter of a great concern for all of us, and what we really need to do to contain the CBRN threat. And I genuinely wish and hope that the CBRN center would come up in India. It is not a luxury, but a necessity for a country like us, which is very densely populated. My gratitude for a very wonderful lecture and enlightening lecture. Thank you so much. We we'll take the questions at the after finishing the lecture, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now it's my privilege to welcome Dr. Malhotra. She will be speaking to us about the cyber warfare, cyber security risks, and the most important topic related to the artificial intelligence, which is going to find applications in all spheres of our life. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Malhotra now to take on the floor and please take us walk us through the aspects of the AI. Thank you. Uh, Jai Hind, all of you, and Namaskar. Uh, this was one of the first occasions of my life where I completely forgot I'm a speaker. I was so immersed in listening to the knowledge and the words of wisdom coming from Kochar Saab to Thabli Saab. I did hear a smatter of what Pandar Saab also said. So my warmest thanks and gratitude to Indic Researchers Forum, particularly this young, uh, vibrant entity called as Yasach, supported by experienced people like all of you. So I don't know whether I would be coming back to the rhythm of cyber wars or not. Permit me to stumble if I do that, because I was so engrossed. I'm sharing, uh, and it, I'll just take uh, two minutes to share my presentation and you'll have to confirm it's visible or not. So can you see your own screen? Your own images, please. We can see your screen. Awesome. So I need your cue. So uh, thanks again for inviting General Kochar and your search. Uh, now the topic in front of us is uh, requiring us to be very alert and to be aware, because what I'm going to share with you is not just a nation's responsibility or an organization's responsibility, but yours and my responsibility. War has come to our desktops, to our mobile, to all the digital devices, maybe our smart TVs. They could be listening to us. They could be recording us. They could be siphoning out our information in a way which is much more sophisticated than our ancestors would have presumed. Uh, with this preamble, it is important for me to share with all of us uh, and revisit the basics of AI, the main uh, identity which was given to me for today's session, is to talk about influence of artificial intelligence in this cyber vulnerable scenario. So AI is when machines behave as intelligently as we do. Yes, we are supposed to be at pinnacle of uh, intellectual quotient, emotional quotient and spiritual quotient. However, machines have just picked up the first bar, which is intelligence. I have yet to encounter a machine which is emotionally empathetic or spiritually clear of world being one place and hence our terror is manifested not because we have so many advantages that you can see on the screen, but because of possibilities of terror that can be, you know, that can be leveraged to attack our minds and our safe existence in the country. Uh, but uh, yes, we do have advantages of AI predicting of what movie I want to see where is, uh, you know, where is a particular direction I want to head towards? Can I have driverless guardies? Yes, I can have. Can my doctors know about my medical history without me carrying my file? Yes, they can. And those software would not just go through the handwritings of all the doctors, but will tangibly give expert advice thanks to AI. 
so many other examples but my job is to frighten and not to reassure you about this so before i do that there are three categories of ai can you see types of ai on the screen please Uh, yes, we can see. Awesome, awesome. So, because last speaker had some problem of moving the file, so I wanted to be reassured. Thank you, sir. Okay, so dear friends, it's very important for us to know that whatever primarily we see around us that is being touted as AI is just weak AI. It is narrow AI. It will just emulate a part of our behavior. It will either talk to us like Siri or it could predict about certain market intelligence like Watson or it would become a legal expert like Ross or it would just drive my car and not cook for me like autonomous vehicle. So this is just one category or domain in which these machines specialize because of the wonderful algorithms embedded in them or you know empowering them. However, there could come a time, which is almost here on our doorsteps, where machines would behave all us, behave similarly in all aspects of our existence. I, they would wake us up, they would cook coffee for us, they would clean our houses, they'll debate intellectually with us, they would tell us about what to do in case we are sick. So it is more than one context, it is being around us like our alter egos. So it is strong AI. However, these strong AIs would still have a machine component if I could presume machine is not intelligent, though we should not go so complacent. So there will be a set of activities, more than one, which strong AIs or deep AIs are capable of performing. However, there is a third genre of AI, which is super intelligence. Now, super intelligence AI or artificial super intelligence or ASI is like, is like my, a superior being to my existence. To know what is artificial super intelligence, you have to watch a movie called as Her, H-E-R, and you would realize that this is much beyond matrix, this is much beyond human beings, this is an all pervasive phenomena which is yet to be encountered on commercial shelves, however, are not impossible to achieve. So with this background, we come to what is our focus, which is safety of our nation. Okay, like Indic has called this as a security mission, something like that. So let us look into what would happen to the face of wars when these kinds of technologies come together. I would take a pause here. I have been talking about AI because that was what was the title. But dear friends, AI never operates in isolation. So when I would look at AI's threats in war or in safety of a country, I would not just look at AI and its algorithms. I should also not forget it is embedded in machines which are all internet active, IoT devices. It is getting processed throughout by big data analytics and much more. So AI is like a family of implicit and explicit technologies that complicate the domain of warfare as well. And that is why uh, AI with all its family members, with all the components like robots, like drones, like natural language processing comes as a suite of problems for us, okay, S-U-I-T-E, not as S-W-E-E-T. So the suite of problems that AI brings with it, when couples with Internet of Things, when coupled with big data analytics, makes the warfare a very complicated, bloodless situation. Our systems could be compromised, our communications could be halted, our systems could be not just contaminated to to misbehave but also to you know to keep a surveillance on us and much beyond so this is why i think indic felt this is an important domain and i did hear a smatter of this in my previous speakers discussions probably this is the reason our honorable prime minister also said that india should be ready for bloodless wars 
and india should work towards its primacy towards a position which is non debatably the highest uh yes but let's go back to the history when i was trying to create history of cyber warfare for this session it was very interesting journey for me i went back to memory lane i tried looking into public domain my own publications and i figured out yes it was year 2010 when stuxnet the first cyber weapon was created to 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 kind of you know to kind of uh, alter the behavior of nuclear weapons in iran it was created by iran and this led to a cascading effect elsewhere we'll see that in the end uh, when we would see how usa reacted to it but as of now yes you could just keep it in your mind that it was 2010 and then we saw subsequently russia and china also coming up with very sophisticated strategic attacks on enemy countries where they were not just uh, directly sabotaging the devices like we saw in 2010 but they were probably like china hacked into some important information of us government russia also kind of you know uh, stop the parliament processes of germany and ukraine but 2016 in i mean i was when i was writing it was endless story there are so many situations i can discuss with you but i've just picked up some of them and this combination will tell you that ai is not the only culprit okay we have ai based intelligent crawlers that can stop large segment of operations on internet but we also have devices which get crippled just because they are interconnected with each other or they are serving very important aspect of our health realm or education realm or industrial uh, you know setup etc and we see examples in 2016 when we realize that lot of our social media components were suddenly down because ai based botnet crawled through we had this very terrifying 2016 instance of a cardiac device getting manipulated if some of my academic peers would recall barely 6 months ago a very young child lost its life in us just because uh, there was some malfunctioning of iot device in the hospital similarly as i said cameras could be not just guarding my property but also looking at me we saw that my smart devices are helping me but my smart vehicle could take me to unpredictable situations especially if i'm a celebrity or a political leader and we saw a jeep hack which another of my cyber security researcher pointed out when i shared with him on making this presentation then we had you know we have reportings of 2017 where machines would not open till ransom is not paid so 2017 established that internet of things is internet of threats and coupled with ai we have reached into a situation which is ready or preparing us for a cyber war remember i told you iran trying to sabotage us interests way back in 2010 but 2019 when drones did similar thing uh president trump the erstwhile president ordered us cyber command to openly launch a digital strike and then we knew time for bloodless coup is on okay and we realized that the next war would be fought not on the borders where yes my soldiers won't be losing their blood all of you hats off again but now my citizens could be the direct you know vulnerable targets and the whole society could go haywire uh more than the devices going amok or more than ai stopping my devices or you know or uh, you know kind of uh, targeting the designer with the life threatening situation we also have poison data sets we also have like my previous speaker mentioned about deep fakes which are you know leading to lot of misperception so they are implicit weaponized models of war okay 
uh, we also have situation where we have uh, intelligence uh, collection and analysis which is so authentic which is done by machines that we have imported we know we are all cribbing very recently government of india said no imports of drones but please understand all the intelligence cctvs in my city in your capital delhi are all imported from china they are beijing products which are siphoning out our cloud activities or mob uh, sentiments much before delhi gets to know beijing knows much before us okay only because these intelligent cctv is intelligent because they are ai part and uh, coupled with facial recognition of cctv uh, their data centers know more about us than we know about our own country situation because it are these are their devices similarly our machines could have uh, infection where everything is getting masked you don't get to know these these malwares they avoid detection but they keep sharing vulnerability points of my network with rogue state or enemy state they are very tough to detect the time when they trigger an attack is so little in one of the situation in north america aerospace defense command they just had 3 minutes of time to assess and confirm and take uh, you know an action or a step to guard themselves so all this has complicated the situation and like my previous speaker said yes sir covid has taught us a lot covid has ushered in digitalization end to end in a manner which was unforeseen in probably by any you know thought leader or clairvoyant nobody could predict use of technology of this magnanimous amount whatever has happened in last 3 years however sir it has complicated fraud tactics it has created new versions of identity which are non existent just because technology is manifesting itself at each and every point of our activity through demonetization through e-commerce through you know network of networks we are finding that the threat surface is increasing not just threat vectors but threat surface is also increasing we have hundreds smart cities announced we have gone more digital so anybody who was earlier not connected is equally under terror of being attacked or becoming uh, or becoming what i would say uh, a reason of attack because if i could be a harmless person in my office network but if i have a backdoor vulnerability a backdoor could you know a, a, a threat vector could creep in and the whole network of the country through iaps network itself could also fall down so you never know who becomes the vector who becomes the target who who is uh, you know becoming uh, the point of infection etc so now it is unfortunately because of pandemic becoming more complicated than ever before of course jurisdictions are not known technologies become so cheap everything is available online so what do we do i think first and foremost we need to understand which we do in all these workshops thanks to indic uh, and many other think tanks however our threat environment is not just out on our borders it could be anywhere around us wherever we have network wherever we have a digital surface our threat environment is possibly uh you know under radar of rogue states we need to have more skills and analytics we need to focus a lot on indigenous manufacturing which i heard in the previous speakers uh, illuminations also we need to have more robust and agile policy frameworks we need to have stronger capabilities one of the forges commodore naresh is doing his phd mphil under me and uh, this is what we came out with that till we don't have a strong regulatory framework we would keep encountering technological barriers organizational barriers and environmental barriers and hence my country will not have easier adoption of technology for development 
okay so it is the crux is regulatory framework and to strengthen our cyber position we need to not just look into regulatory framework in terms of strategy cyber security strategy you know india has come to position 10 all over the world which is hats off to general pant for leading us there as a national cyber security coordinator of our country however we need to also look into uh, revamping our critical information infrastructure we need to look into uh, uh, redelegation of roles and responsibilities to ncii pc i think time for public private partnership with foreign collaboration or foreign with a pinch of salt i would still not forget to be atmanirbhar but i could always look into technologies or knowledge exchange and then come up with indigenous development of drones or devices or iot or anything which my country needs but go more inwards than outwards we also need to have uh, reporting infrastructures that are stronger than what they are now they should be multilingual as i said anybody could be a threat surface uh, so each and every person should have mechanisms and access to report yes we do have cybercrime.gov.in but it needs to be augmented the cyber laws of our country we do need to look into organizational strengthening we need to have uh, i beseech all of you to look into the possibility or the name to the right people about coming up with an it act which is very ai friendly and iot friendly open to all these technologies yes we are building up data centers we are talking of data localization however we are still not sure whether india has that data center ability all the research shows we have budget is also in, uh, you know emphasized but we need to look into it through a comprehensive data protection legal and regulatory framework so that at the end india is a global hub of ai india looks at ai not with terror but with as a tool but as a tool of inclusive development which is responsible which is leading to future which is wonderful i would close my session by telling you there are still two lines of thought people who don't trust ai and people who are very optimistic about ai this is just a representation it's up to you to believe which side is right so thanks again and i'm open to questions thank you uh dr malhotra i must thank you for a very enlightening discourse which you have given on uh, ai and the cyber security we will take on the questions after we finish the last speaker uh, i must uh, compliment you on the comprehensive uh, canvas which you painted in a such a short time giving us the view of the uh, threats as well as the utility of ai uh, we'll take on the questions later later thank you so very much uh, it's now my proud privilege to uh, invite dr push bajaj he will be talking to us the a very sensitive topic of the climate change and how it gets connect with the national security and when we say national security it is not just the military security there are economic security elements food security element water security elements and i'm sure dr bajaj will walk us through those important facets and will come up with certain important recommendations which will be implementable by, by us in the future thank you so much floor is yours dr prajaj great thank you very much sir uh, thank you uh, chair for the kind words of introduction uh, and also thank you uh, to the organizers at the indic researchers forum for uh, giving me the opportunity to share uh, my views in this very important uh, conference and this uh, very uh, important uh, session panel discussion uh, i will just uh, share my screen very quickly and get started uh, with my presentation Uh, could you please confirm that you can see my screen in full screen mode and you see the title uh, yes please thank you great thank you sir uh, so the uh, title of my presentation for today is uh, climate change threats to india's food and water security uh, i thought i'll begin with a with a broad overview of all the ways in which climate change is affecting uh, our environment and what are the socio economic consequences of that 
So some of you, if not all of you in the audience uh, will be familiar that there are some primary climatic changes, for example, increasing atmospheric temperatures, uh, changing rainfall patterns, uh, sea level rise, uh, increasing ocean temperatures and changing ocean chemistry. Uh, these are not all of them, but these are some of the primary ones that, uh, you know, are of most in uh, are of most interest to us. Uh, these then have secondary impacts, for example, extreme terrestrial heat waves, uh, frequent floods, uh, frequent droughts, uh, increased pest attacks, uh, land erosion and salinization, uh, intense cyclones, extreme marine heat waves, uh, hypoxia, which is the condition of reduced oxygen content in the ocean water, uh, and there is ocean acidification. Then these secondary impacts can have cascading uh, risks or cascading impacts, uh, which are of consequence uh, for a country's uh, national security, particularly the food and water security, uh, which include crop failures, desertification, uh, loss of marine ecosystems and collapse of marine biodiversity. Now, these uh, primary and secondary impacts are uh, very closely interlinked with each other, often in very complex ways. Uh, and similarly, the secondary impacts lead to cascading risks, which are also interlinked with each other uh, in many complicated ways. And together, all of this can very easily lead to a situation where we can have uh, these uh, these uh, impacts acting together uh, or one after the other, which can lead to a food and serious food and water crisis uh, in the country. Of course, in the period of the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so, I will not be able to cover all of these uh, impacts, but I will uh, I would like to talk about some of these which are highlighted uh, in green here. Uh, so going into the going into some of the more specific aspects of these uh, growing changes, we know that the problem of climate change really begins with uh, the changing uh, global average temperature, uh, which is a direct consequence of the changing uh, concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, of those greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is one of the most uh, important ones because uh, of its long lifetime uh, in the atmosphere. So this graph here is showing the change in the carbon dioxide concentration, which is shown in the red curve uh, and the temperature, which is shown in the black curve. So on the X axis, you can see that the year goes from 1880 to 2019. And on the Y axis, you see on the right hand side, uh, right hand side, the carbon dioxide concentration and on the left hand side is the global average temperature. So clearly both of them have been rising uh, at an accelerating pace, not just uh, at a linear pace, but at an accelerating pace uh, over the last uh, century or more. Now, what are some of the consequences of this rising, ocean, uh, rising atmospheric temperature? Uh, there are knock-on effects of rising temperature. Uh, what else happens because of changing temperature distribution uh, is that with every one degree rise in temperature, the atmospheric water vapor content increases by 7%. Uh, in other words, evaporation increases. Now, because of that, we are seeing an increasing amount of the number of dry days uh, in a year and which leads to droughts. So this graph, this image here is showing the uh, change in annual frequency of droughts per decade uh, between the period of 1951 to 2016. And this is taken from a recent government report, uh, which was published in 2020 by the Ministry of Earth Sciences. Uh, clearly, you can see that particularly in the North, uh, North India and Northeast of India, uh, we can see that there has been a, a significant increase in the frequency of droughts per decade between 1951 and 2016. Now, another consequence of rising, ocean, uh, rising atmospheric temperature is that when the, when the atmosphere is able to hold more water vapor, it means that when it rains, it, it pours down uh, more in a more extreme manner than it did previously. And that can be seen in the trend of uh, severe flood events over India over the last few decades. So here you can see on the x-axis is the year going from 1985 uh, to 2020. And on the y-axis is the frequency of uh, severe flood events. And clearly there is a rising trend uh, in the number of flood events. Now floods can of course be caused by a number of uh, uh, reasons. It could be monsoonal flooding or it could be uh, you know, flash flooding or uh, cyclonic storms. Uh, and this is again taken from the same uh, government report that was published in 2020 by the Ministry of Earth Sciences. And the report also found that the frequency of very severe cyclonic storms during the post monsoon season has increased significantly uh, by plus one event per decade uh, during the last two decades. 
Now, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that you have heard this before that because of climate change, extreme weather events are becoming more intense and more frequent. But I think that this slide here really helps to internalize what that actually means and how can we visualize it, uh, visualize that. So these three graphs here are showing the uh, temperature anomalies over the northern hemisphere for the period of June, July, August. Now the location and the time period does not really matter because the profile will look the same in different parts of the world uh, and for different uh, periods of the year. So on the extreme left hand side, you can see the uh, time period of 1951 to 1980 and you can see the temperature distribution. Now the zero in this graph corresponds to the the average temperature um, and then uh, going towards the right are higher temperatures and going towards the left are lower temperatures. So we can see that it forms kind of like a bell shaped curve where the highest probability is at the center, which is the average temperature. And then as we go to higher or lower temperatures, the probability of those events uh, decreases. Now in this type of uh, historical kind of climate, what we call extreme weather events are uh, events which are highlighted here, which are very high in temperature, uh, but they are, because they're very high in temperature, they're also very low in frequency, they're very low in probability. Now, if you go to the middle graph, which is the period of uh, 1990 to 2000, we can see that because of uh, rising global average temperature, this the center of the graph has shifted uh, towards the right. It has shifted towards uh, the hotter temperatures. Because of that, the entire distribution has now shifted towards the right. And in this new distribution, what we used to call extreme events are now not so low in probability. They're in their probability of occurrence has increased quite significantly. And if we go to the extreme right hand graph, which is the last decade of 2009 to 2019, now you can see that the average has shifted a lot towards the right. And along with it, the entire distribution has shifted towards the right. And in this new uh, climate, what used to be extreme weather, extreme rare events are no longer uh, extreme or rare events. They are actually very much part of the distribution. Another consequence of this is that uh, now we are seeing extreme events which previously did not even exist in the distribution and now they are showing up as the new uh, extreme events. Uh, so just to sum up, the distribution of weather parameters it is shifting. What used to be extreme low probability events are now becoming more common uh, and the extremes that previously did not even exist in the distribution are now showing up as the extreme rare events. Now, why is this relevant for the topic of this conference? Because it is the extreme events which have the most significant impact on our agricultural production. Uh, if the temperature goes uh, above or below slightly than the average over a period of time, then the agricultural practices, the farmers and the agricultural practices can adapt to it. But it's only the extreme events. For example, if a heat wave lasts for more than a couple of weeks, uh, or up to a month, or there is a flash flooding, or there is a you know monsoonal flood, then those extreme events are the ones that have the most significant impact uh, on our agricultural production. Uh, in addition to this, there are also long-term challenges uh, which are coming out of climate change that will also have an impact on the food and water security of our country. So this slide here is showing the projections in uh, sea level rise. Uh, for the in the x-axis you can see the year going from 1950 to 2100 which is the end of this century and on the y-axis is the different projections uh, for uh, sea level change <clears throat> now when we talk about future uh, projections of uh, anything which is related to climate change uh, what scientists use to predict the future are computer models essentially they uh, take the current environmental conditions and they plug into it the expected change in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the future and then they look at how the conditions will evolve uh, 50 years from now or 100 years from now. So because there are many variables that go into it, there are uh, different scenarios that are being built by scientists. So on the y-axis you can see that there are different curves. There are red color curves and then there are blue colored curves and they correspond to the different scenarios. So the blue ones correspond to low emission scenario in which we take urgent transformative action to mitigate our carbon emissions, uh, which will lead to a lower level of uh, future global warming. <coughs> uh, 
and the red ones correspond to high emission scenario in which we essentially don't do anything uh, to resolve the problem and we continue on business as usual and that will of course lead to a higher temperature rise which will lead to a higher uh, global uh, which will lead to a higher rise in sea level uh, which is because of melting glaciers and melting uh, ice caps and so on now according to these projections uh, the in the in the high emission scenario the projected global mean sea level rise is of the order of uh, 0.63 to uh, 1.01 meters <clears throat> now i don't think i have to uh, you know explain to you the consequences of a 1 meter sea level rise uh, by the year 2100 uh, which will of course have heavy socio economic uh, impacts now uh, the reason why this is important this is actually taken from a recent uh, <coughs> report by the united nations uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change which was published last year in 2021 for the first time in this report uh, the un ipcc also acknowledged that there are significant uncertainties in the way that we make these projections so we cannot be 100 percent sure of what the uh, future sea level might look like and therefore they also inclu included this scary looking dashed line that you can see on the screen uh, right here which talks about a low likelihood high impact storyline and low likelihood in my personal opinion is just euphemism for we don't really know uh, we don't really know how fast these changes will occur and we don't really know the magnitude of sea level rise that we might see uh, in the future and according to this low likelihood high impact scenario the expected sea level rise by the uh, year 2100 uh, could approach as high as two meters uh, by the end of the century so again uh, i don't think i have to explain to you what the uh, socio-economic consequences of a two, two meters uh, change in sea level Again, why is this relevant for the topic of this uh, discussion, uh, which is on food and water security? We know that when there is sea level rise, there is land erosion in coastal areas, uh, which can, uh, you know, which can make us lose important agricultural land in coastal areas. Also, when there is sea level rise, we know that there is salinization of coastal lands, and if the sea water in, uh, gets into underground uh, underground water aquifers, then we lose uh, fresh water availability. And also, if uh, we have salinization of agricultural lands, then we lose food production uh, because most crops cannot uh, handle saline water. <coughs> uh, another very important, uh, probably the most important aspect for uh, India is the changes in the Asian monsoon that we are seeing uh, because of uh, increasing global average temperatures. Now, uh, just briefly, we know that the uh, Asian monsoon uh, is based on, uh, you know, the winds that flow from uh, basically when there is summer months, the land mass uh, increases in temperature. So that creates a low pressure area above the land mass and the ocean is relatively cooler, which has a which creates a high pressure area over the ocean. Uh, and that leads to winds from the southwest to the northeast, which creates the summer monsoon. And then when we go to the winter months, the situation is actually completely different. And now the land mass uh, cools down faster than the ocean. So that creates a high pressure area over the land mass. And the ocean is still warm because it takes longer for it to cool down. Uh, and so that creates a low pressure area over the ocean. And now we have winds flowing from the northeast uh, to the southwest. Now, this is, uh, uh, this is a very uh, unique aspect of the Asian monsoon that it changes its wind direction completely going from summer to winter months. Now this, the strength of the monsoon is actually very, uh, uh, you know, it, it depends heavily on the land ocean temperature gradient, the temperature difference between the land mass and the ocean. Now, because of uh, rising uh, ocean, rising temperatures, because of greenhouse gases, we are now seeing a, a change in this land ocean temperature gradient. Uh, one of the uh, important factors in this context is the declining snow cover in the Himalayan uh, peaks. Because of that declining snow cover, the land mass is actually heating up faster than the ocean. The ocean is also experiencing uh, increasing ocean warming. Uh, and because of that, this, this critical balance that previously was kind of a, a thing that we took for granted uh, that, you know, the Asian monsoon was a very robust uh, monsoon season uh, and it would return every year with the same frequency and same intensity. That balance is now changing because of uh, global warming and that is changing this uh, very important monsoon season. Of course, India receives over 75% 
of its rainfall during the monsoon months uh, and india's uh, over 50% of india's agriculture is still reliant upon natural rainfall because of lack of artificial irrigation facilities so if we change the monsoon uh, it will have significant impact on agricultural production and in turn on the uh, national economy and we are we are seeing continuously uh, in the news we are seeing headlines that are telling us that are giving us hints of how uh, these impacts of climate change are making uh, a dent in india's agricultural production and india's economy uh, these are just some of the headlines that i've picked out in just the last uh, one or two years uh, you know kerala for example witnessed back to back uh, monsoonal floods extreme monsoonal floods uh, in 2018 2019 and 2020 uh, which led to significant damage to agricultural production uh, cyclone amphan which was a major uh, cyclone uh, in the east coast uh, of course affected uh, you know farmers and uh, agricultural production in west bengal uh, cyclone taute which uh, you know was kind of unthinkable uh, for the west coast uh, even 5 years or 10 years ago uh, cyclones like that in the west coast are now becoming more common uh, primarily because of rising ocean temperatures uh, which will of course have uh, impacts on agricultural production and this is not something that is only peculiar to india uh, it is being experienced increasingly in different parts of the world uh, this graph here is showing the uh, production loss in agricultural uh, you know crop yields uh, due to disasters over the period of 2005 to 2015 and it is divided in the different regions uh, now what came out of this uh, assessment of the united nations food and agricultural organization uh, is that floods and droughts together actually accounted for over 50 percent of the agricultural loss during this period so these are the two major like i was saying before that these are the two major uh, disasters which are being affected by climate change that have the most significant impact on agricultural uh, production now so the important question is well what do we do about it we, uh, by the way i could not go into all of the different ways in which climate change is affecting agricultural production and water security but this was just a, a kind of a brief overview of the of some of the more important aspects now so what do we do about it what 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 do we need to do uh, to maintain continued security and prosperity uh, for the country and also for our food and water security uh, i believe that there needs to be a three pronged approach uh, the first one is where we take deep emissions reductions uh, in we have to change the way uh, that we handle our economic systems and reduce the dependency on fossil fuels uh, for example oil and natural gas and, and so on not just for the uh, reasons uh, that are related to climate change but also because they are uh, you know indeed uh, fossil uh, they are limited in resources and it is in our best interest to in general move away from them and move into uh, more permanent and more renewable sources uh, of energy the second one is large scale carbon drawdown because there is now enough carbon that is built up into the atmosphere that even if we stop all, all carbon emissions uh, the climate will still continue to change so we need to bring down the uh, carbon dioxide level to a safe uh, to a safe limit uh, so for that we need large scale carbon drawdown it's not just enough to have uh, uh, emissions reductions and finally we need to have dynamic climate adaptation again because of the fact that uh, there are some impacts of climate change that have already occurred and we need to, we need to adapt our systems for those changes uh, because they are now unavoidable so if we look at the global greenhouse gas emissions uh, by sector we see that a large portion of it actually comes from the energy uh, sector and then energy is further divided into energy and industry uh, transportation uh, commercial and residential buildings and so on uh, then there is uh, agricultural uh, forestry and land use which is the next most important uh, factor which is leading to greenhouse gas emissions so that is uh, coming from livestock and uh, manure and agricultural uh, soils in fact you know our agricultural practices themselves are a, a big contributor to greenhouse gases uh, and there is a lot of uh, room for develop for uh, improvement there uh, then there is the waste sector and the industry sector so clearly if we want to prioritize action it has to be uh, prioritized in the energy sector and it is not that we are not doing anything about it uh, of course india has uh, made some ambitious commitments uh, at, at the latest uh, cop 26 the conference of party six parties 
our 26th of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was held uh, last year. Uh, and Prime Minister uh, Sri Narendra Modi made uh, you know, ambitious commitments on behalf of the country uh, to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2070 and also install 500 gigawatts of non-fossil energy capacity by 2030. Now, these are very ambitious targets and it would require transformative changes in almost all sectors of the economy to achieve these uh, targets. Uh, and I highlighted the word transformative because it's not just enough uh, to have incremental change, it has to be disruptive transformative change in order to meet these uh, targets. Uh, this would also require protection, conservation and expansion of mainland and coastal ecosystems uh, such as mangroves, uh, rainforests, seagrass, etc. Uh, because these ecosystems sequester large amounts of carbon dioxide, they also regulate the climate and the water cycle uh, in addition to, of course, the myriad uh, socio-economic socio benefits that they provide uh, to the society. Uh, some impacts of climate change are unavoidable now, even if we stop all greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow. Uh, therefore, protecting our critical infrastructure, including our agricultural practices uh, against these impacts will be critical for the continued security and pros prosperity of the economy. Uh, for example, you know, to the best of my knowledge, I have not seen uh, a very, uh, you know, uh, holistic approach to making our agricultural systems more resilient uh, to climate change or even to disasters like floods and droughts and we definitely need that now more than ever. Uh, we must develop and uh, promote practices to reduce the vulnerability of agricultural, uh, agri agriculture to uh, natural temperature and rainfall patterns. Uh, like I mentioned before that over 50% of agriculture in India uh, is still dependent on monsoon rains uh, and for we, that needs to change because if we cannot rely on the monsoon anymore then we need to have uh, alternative options for that. So improving irrigational facilities, artificial greenhouse setups will be critical uh, in that. And also diversification of agricultural crops and the use of engineered crops in, uh, of course, uh, considering the, uh, you know, all the uh, benefits, uh, pros and cons of doing that uh, will also become important. Uh, Socio-technical innovation would be critical to tackle contemporary challenges to water and food security. Uh, in this context, we must promote, promote uh, local uh, innovation, uh, indigenous innovation uh, to solve local level challenges. Uh, this is particularly relevant in coastal areas where, you know, they are the most familiar with the changes that are occurring in the environment. So we have to promote local level uh, innovation to solve these uh, challenges. Uh, however, on the other hand, climate change is, of course, a global problem. Uh, which would require global cooperation. Uh, in this context, there is a need to utilize uh, existing regional and sub-regional frameworks such as the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, uh, the Quad Security Dialogue, uh, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, BIMSTEC and ASEAN and promote uh, and prioritize climate change mitigation and adaptation as the action points in these uh, frameworks. Of course, many of them have an environment component uh, within them, uh, but the urgency and the, you know, the uh, the need to deal with these uh, uh, challenges is still not prioritized uh, in these frameworks. Uh, I will just I will stop at that point and thank you all very much for your attention and briefly mention the team that we have at the National Maritime Foundation. Uh, we have our chairman, Admiral Karambir Singh, who is the uh, ex-chief of the Naval Staff, our director general, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, our executive director, uh, Commodore Devesh Lehri, and our deputy director, uh, Commander uh, Saurav Mohanty. Uh, my name is Dr. Push Bajaj. I'm the head of the Blue Economy and Climate Change Cluster uh, at the National Maritime Foundation and the cluster also includes uh, two other researchers, Dr. Saurabh Thakur and Dr. Chini Yudon, who are both associate fellows at the National Maritime Foundation. Uh, thank you once again for your attention and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Bajaj. It was a very enlightening uh, presentation and it shows the depth of your knowledge on the subject. You did uh, point out the various hazards which are emerging and which are going to impact India's economy, especially the agricultural uh, food crop cycles and its uh, advantages and disadvantages as well as the measures which could be taken. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your enlightening uh, lecture on to this particular aspect. Thank you, uh, we will now move on to the question and answer question uh, session and uh, I will go exactly in the same order 
in which the presentations were made for the ease of uh, monitoring. I hope it's okay. Uh, General Kocha, the first question is addressed to you. It says that uh, whenever India tries to institute some reformative measures, there are foreign powers which come into play and try and time those uh, reformative measures as such. The examples which were cited that the efforts were made to scuttle the USA and India nuclear deal, as well as when this our uh, agriculture reforms were brought in, uh, there were foreign efforts to scuttle those. So what is your opinion and uh, what are the measures India could take to ensure that the foreign interference does not impact onto the national reformative measures? Thank you, sir. Very good question. Uh, basically, uh, for a, a, a nation to be effective, uh, it must have a national power. And the three important uh, pillars of the national power for any nation is the economy, the military, and the diplomatic. Uh, a long period of time, uh, we uh, kept ourselves uh, isolated from the major uh, powers of the world. We uh, distanced ourselves from the Americans. We uh, relied too much on the Russians. Uh, today, for example, your uh, military or your Indian army has got a predominance of Russian equipment and the Indian Air Force also. So uh, when you uh, do not align your uh, foreign uh, policy to strengthen your uh, country, you will uh, find uh, such diverse uh, powers trying to scuttle your uh, process of uh, gaining prominence on the world stage. So my, and I'm extremely uh, happy that this government has initiated certain amount of defense reforms. As a matter of fact, I have been in this business of logistics for the last 27 years and we were totally dependent on our ordnance factory board and we were not getting the requirement in terms of quality and quantity. So the corporatization has taken place. So I'm just uh, giving you a background to the question that unless a country has many options, multifarious options, it will not be able to scuttle these powers to be who try to uh, attempt to scuttle your uh, a particular uh, you know, relation with a particular country. So I'm uh, hopeful that in the times to come and the type of uh, outreach our prime minister has today that he has built up relations. He has visited so many countries. So the world is now uh, looking up to India. And uh, I think in the times to come, uh, this should be the approach. Uh, so, if you permit me, may I ask you a question? Yes, yes, please. please. Uh, basically, sir, you very succinctly brought out the need for educating the civil society. Because if the society is not educated, the damages which you have clearly pointed out are really alarming and they should give us a wake up call. If all uh, of us say think tanks and other governing bodies, etc., do understand the need for educating the civil mass. Why there is no concerted effort? Why there is no authorized body to understand the requirements and put the implementive measures in place? Why are we lacking into it? Are we waiting for disaster to happen and strike us before we wake up and do something? Thank you, sir. Uh, you, excellent question, sir. I mean, the uh, point is that uh, the resolve has to come from the national leadership because they are the ones who have to set the roadmap uh, 
uh, or us. But unfortunately, what, what actually is uh, happening is in the you, you basically you know uh, we are a democracy, and so we give an opportunity to everybody to say his word. Uh, today, if you would have noticed that on uh, matters of national security itself. the political uh, leadership is divided a uh, moment uh, government is taking out a statement which concerns our security of the nation it is uh, being opposed by the political parties and what is uh, happening is that uh, the people who uh, am allegiant to a particular uh, political uh, party only want to listen to what the leaders of their party are saying and a result of which our entire civil society is fractured today we have lost our own sense of reasoning our own sense of logic and we are blindly following these political ideologies and that is why you see in a particular state a uh, a particular type of agenda is followed in some other state a different kind of agenda is followed you take for example covid itself the certain measures which were implemented by the government were not followed in many states just because they did not have the same political party in power in that state so unless these political differences are set aside for the sake of our country's strength and unity i don't think we as a country can move ahead so thank you sir that is the message to the political leadership thank you sir uh, karna rathole you wanted to say something on this please go ahead uh, yes uh, in fact i would like to uh compliment uh, general coach for bringing out a very pertinent uh, subject about civil society uh, getting empowered to uh, you know uh, get united and uh, curb this uh, issue of uh, diversification within our society uh, just had uh, two small uh, uh, inputs or probably uh, questions to you uh, do you feel uh, firstly that the subject of civics and moral science be uh sort of reinstituted with vigor in our uh, high schools uh, our schools rather uh, and the second question is that uh, do you feel uh, uh, ncc or a similar kind of a program should be mandated in schools and colleges It's very good question ram uh, this was my uh, this suggestion was uh, there in my talk with regard to ncc what ncc teaches you uh, the motto of uh, ncc itself is unity and discipline so these two uh, words an uh, ncc inculcates into his uh, cadets and uh, since after retirement i have uh, joined educational institution and i was a dean there also i found both these two important aspects of personality of a student lacking in by and large i would say that everybody doesn't have it but the majority don't have it and if you see the reasons if you go back into the reasons it is the way our education system is built up today you rightly said that civic and a uh, moral science used to be a uh, two uh, subjects which uh, we had when uh, we were in school B but uh, now it is being actually overlooked so i uh, feel this national education policy 2020 which has uh, come about and which is attempting to uh, make a change into the entire uh, primary uh, secondary and and the higher education structure should focus on this important aspect because as i told you that more than 65% of our population is less than 35 years old so 
unless these young children are brought up in with the right values and beliefs tolerance to each other's religion respect for each other's point of view we will then ultimately you know face these problems what we are facing today thank you thank you thank you sir uh to be fair to other speakers uh, i may be allowed to put questions to dr athole please first of the question says what are the other biological weapons other than the anthrax which could be used that was part one of the question and part two of the question was uh, possession of a biological weapon by a nation does it give a deterrence advantage okay i'll take them in the same sequence that you have asked uh, firstly uh, there are many biological agents which are there in nature uh which are afflicting humans and animals uh, and plants alike now uh there are many of these agents which are lethal which are highly contagious and if you are able to weaponize them if you are able to deploy them in an offensive manner yes uh, it can be a, a big uh, problem to uh, the mankind and to the animal kind uh the nature of uh, chemical uh, the uh, biological agents is not just anthrax or uh, virus of different kinds but it is also the bacteria it is also the toxins i mean plague uh, ebola marburg uh, tularemia uh, smallpox any of these can be used and weaponized to uh, cause uh, casualties so uh, there are many such agents which are there and it is therefore the point which i mentioned and uh, in my talk also that it is the security of laboratories and research establishments which should be of concern so that none of the agents especially the lethal type of agents which they are researching on or working on leaks out from that lab and causes such kind of casualties so that is how we should be able to prevent a bioterrorism kind of an incident you address two things one is deny the technology for weaponization and the second is to secure the source of that particular agent so if you are able to do these two you should be able to uh, relatively protect yourself from such kind of threats the second question is do biological warfare agents give you a deterrent value uh, i would say no the reason is uh, there are 186 countries today who are signatories to the biological and toxin weapons convention in fact most of the countries in the world are signatories to that uh very few small countries or new countries may not have signed it as yet but uh, all the countries that matter uh, which have the capability and technology uh, and expertise to develop such kind of weapon system they are all signatories to the biological uh, weapons convention so they are obligated not to make not to store and never to use such weapon systems so if your aggressors or your uh, uh, competitors uh, are not likely to use these kind of weapon systems you having them is not going to affect deterrence even if you have it it doesn't really make a uh, you know dent in your deterrence capability or non deterrence capability because you are also signatory to the bwc and you are not going to use it in warfare non warfare state sponsored terrorism non state actors the field is open and therefore we cannot really dictate Uh, whether because the btwc doesn't apply to non state actors or terrorists so uh, then the question of deterrence doesn't stand to use because as a state you're not going to use it thank you sir the next question was in any case pertain to the non state actors which you already answered okay uh, only one thing in the, uh, in case of a non state actors if i may ask you as there is a say we have got so many controls for the nuclear technology but still the clandestine nuclear technology finds its proliferation in the world do you think that there is also chances of the such sensitive bio weapon or something like that they will also be clandestinely supplied to the non state actors is that possible yes it is possible it is possible the state may not uh, overtly uh, develop or stock uh, biological weapons but it could always develop it clandestinely and supply it to non state actors to be used in an aggressor's uh, country so such kind of threats can happen so you that is where cbrn terrorism comes in 
and if you are able to secure yourself against that by denying the source and denying the technology then you will be able to do it because if it's a source which has to come from outside a biological weapon which has to come into your country if your port and uh, border security agencies are aware and trained to intercept and identify these kind of thing you will be able to prevent an incident from taking place at the same time within the country if an agent is brought in and being attempted to be weaponized within your country it requires technology it requires skill it requires a place a laboratory if you are able to deny these kind of things to the terrorists then you will be able to save yourself from such threats thank you so much sir thank you uh, then coming to dr malhotra the first question pertains to how the blockchain and the crypto are related to artificial intelligence thank you sir uh, anything under technology is presumed to be connected to each other it's not like that however uh, blockchain is a great mechanism of creating trust if i could say uh, for example if i would keep my will on a blockchain that is designated to keep uh, legal documents or legal instruments then the chances of this will be being tampered are lesser as as compared to the one that is kept in manual format now in our instance what when we talking about national security what i would feel is military documents when kept on blockchain uh, are presumed to be more safe than the ones that are kept elsewhere even in uh, digital format on our machines even if they are very safe however sir i would want my audience to take it with a pinch of salt because a blockchain is an energy guzzler there are two kinds of blockchain proof of concept and proof of work uh, the newer version the bitcoin version was energy guzzler the kind of carbon emissions that happen are unbelievably high so when we talk of sustainability and environment targets blockchain is never a ready made answer second they are expensive technology india is still experimenting with it talking about cryptos in the same breath as blockchain is not a very fair tradition because uh, cryptos represent a digital asset and there are many other digital assets like now we have nfts we have decentralized financial institutes etc so that is a totally different prerogative and discussion point however i would just uh, leave my audience with the thought that it is not always that uh, cryptos or nfts are uh, profit making agent agents they they we recently heard uh, rbi governor saying it's not a tulip phenomena so be very cautious of investing there but that doesn't mean that india should not be ready for this kind of uh, ad uh, technology advancement we are preparing but we need to look into its swot analysis sector to sector vertical to vertical and defense definitely is a good use case for blockchain but not crypto thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, i have a question for you you did bring out the utility of the ai in uh, various spheres of our life if that is the case uh, we are running so critically short of the data scientist in india uh what are the measures india needs to take to overcome this uh, shortage of data scientists because if you do not have the qualified data scientists then there is nothing called you can do into the ai field is what is my limited understanding what is your comment on this ma'am thank you uh thank you sir if you recall in my way forward i did mention about capacity augmentation uh in ai and uh, data analytics is just one way of looking at you are so much on the right track when you presume that data if it is not processed to give information or knowledge will be like as an unnecessary expensive junk okay we we always keep saying data is information data is new oil i say data is gold it can be molded to suit or you know answer a query however data needs proper processing abilities also not just in human terms which you talked about i totally agree but also in terms of computing power and it's not just data analytics my country should focus on but also on quantum computing which is the new way to protect 
our uh, cyber spaces because the kind of capabilities and ruggedness and robustness that will come if we couple data analytics with quantum computing we are definitely we would be ahead of the everybody else in the trajectory but i don't need to say again that yes you are right on the point and we should start teaching cyber security and data analytics when when our kids are born if i can hand over a smartphone to my 3 year old grandchild why can't i teach him or her about cyber security and data management thank, thank you. you uh dr bajaj coming to you it's a very pertinent question that with the increase in population and the various factors which are affecting uh, right to the uh, urbanization industrial development the pressures on the land are going to increase tremendously especially in a country like india where there is a, a dense population so if these land pressures are going to increase how india should be prepared to tackle this particular problem and i think it's a real genuine concern your comments please yes definitely sir uh, it is in fact uh, the case that you know india is a land scarce and i mean because of the population india is scarce in many resources in water in in uh, food in land for agriculture and and so on so that is definitely a challenge and you know i come from the uh, national maritime foundation and you know our suggestion is that you go towards the seas and you try to use the potential of the seas whether it's in the form of uh, you know space for renewable energy for example uh, we know that ocean based sources of renewable energy like uh, wave energy tidal energy and even offshore wind energy uh, they all have uh, you know a lot of potential but they are currently being utilized uh, not at all i mean uh, it's just all of that vast ocean space is just uh, is just there for us to be ex uh, to be explored uh, similarly when it comes to uh, the marine biodiversity and the natural uh, living resources in the oceans uh, the fish and also other uh, species uh, they can then they uh, they will have uh, increasing pressure on them for supplying uh, food to the country when we uh, see that uh, land based agriculture production uh, is not enough Uh, for us so then you know you have to move in that direction uh, and something that i also saw in that question uh, you know uh, the same question that you read out that uh, all of these sectors uh, tourism and agriculture itself they are all producing uh, greenhouse gases and so how do you make sure that you know we balance our needs uh, with the need of the hour which is to reduce our emissions i think that the important point there is that you know we need to have a discussion which is which includes all the different perspectives that all of the people with different expertise need to be in the room when you are making these decisions so that when you are coming up with a policy for uh, exploitation of resources or for agriculture and so on then there is someone with the expertise and with the knowledge of the climate uh, uh, you know conditions and so on to say that okay we cannot do it this way we have to find an alternative way because if you do it this way then you will have these consequences so in that sense when we talk about multi stakeholder dis uh, discussions that becomes essential uh, in these uh, in these discussions thank you sir thank you very much with this we uh, come to the end of this particular session uh, i must thank uh, major general kocha uh, dr rama thule dr malhotra and dr bajaj i must uh, admit allowing me to the chair the session the only non doctor in this galaxy i am absolutely honored and humbled by the courtesy which has been extended to me thank you so much and thank you for answering the questions and obviously this session wouldn't have been so productive without the interactive questions from the audience so my special thanks to audience also indic forum my gratitude for giving me this opportunity for chairing the sessions thank you so much jai hind over to you thank you deshmukh sir you. thank you all the speakers and thank you to the session chair for such an enlightening session please stay tuned for the next session thank